Good morning, Denver Community Church. It's so good to be with you all this morning. If we have not met before, my name is Maggie Knight and I am the children's pastor here at DCC. Oh, thanks. I love when I get the opportunity to share from the platform, which is something that I get to do a handful of times each year. And if you can believe it, we are in the big countdown for Easter Sunday next week. We're entering into Holy Week. And so that makes today officially like Easter Eve of sorts, if you will. I don't know if that's a thing, but we're in the big lead up. If you grew up in the church or maybe you happen to follow the liturgical calendar in your spare time, I don't really know what you're into. Uh, that means that today is fondly, or shall I say frondly, referred to as Palm Sunday. I know, I'm sorry, I had to do it. I do believe for me, it was a very formative memory, maybe also for many of you, to be absolutely destroyed and swatted in the face with a palm frond bestowed upon you and your brothers by an innocent Sunday school teacher? I don't know, just an example. That is seared into my memory. Some of you have never experienced palm frond trauma, and it shows. Good for you, I love that for you. But for those of us who may seem like a little edgy, a little anxious, maybe your head is on a swivel because it's Palm Sunday, I want you to know I see you, I'm with you. You're not alone. Years ago, when I became the children's pastor, I had to make an informed decision on whether or not to take part in palm frond culture uh, for kids, and I'm firmly in the no palm fronds camp, in case that wasn't abundantly obvious by now. Uh, kids tend to make anything a weapon, and that was no exception. So I'm sorry to the kids, and you're welcome to all of the parents and adults in the room. With that said, if you've been here over the last few weeks or if you've been following along at home, we are in the middle of following Jesus through the Easter story, specifically in the Gospel of Mark. Last week, Hannah Tom, our spiritual formation pastor, spoke about Jesus' triumphal entry, his procession to his crucifixion on the cross, and that is where we will pick up today. I'll be reading our scripture reference from the Gospel of Mark, verse, verses, uh, chapter 15, verses 29 through 41. You can read along with me on the screens. You can read from the Bible in front of you. You can be on your device if you prefer. And I don't think I'm burying the lead here, but the passage in scripture is titled, The Death of Jesus. And it says this, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were there also. Wow. Biblical mic drop moment, right? TLDR, the Cliff's Notes version, is that Jesus dies here. The main character, the central figure of our faith, the hub, the axis dies here. And so in case you aren't picking up what I'm putting down, this is significant. 
So significant, in fact, that I incorrectly assumed that this is the exact moment when we move from BC, before Christ, to AD, after death. But here is a little bit of trivia for you. AD doesn't stand for after death, like many of us may falsely assume, but actually stands for Anno Domini, AKA the year of our Lord. So that's actually a Christmas reference, wrong holiday. Uh, But even still, this is huge. Each year at Easter, this is what we revisit. Everything leading up to this is the inciting incident, the rising action, and then here is the climax of the Easter story. This is the crescendo of what we've been building up to all of this time. If this were a Sunday night HBO series, everyone would be talking about this on Monday morning. Like, did you hear about what happened on the Mount? I had a friend who saw it, etc., etc. This is our Jon Snow moment. Okay, I've actually never watched Game of Thrones, but I feel like that example stands up and it sounds right. We'll go with it. This was a big deal. It was a big deal to everyone that was there. However, it was a big deal because of who Jesus said he was, but not necessarily because of the way he died. You see, crucifixion was the norm at the time. They were well acquainted with crucifixion, sadly. And Mark's words here are to express solace for what they were going through, not necessarily to express shock at the act of crucifixion itself. And because this was such a big deal, because Jesus was a big deal, it was and still is, to be honest, hard to grapple with. It's hard to understand the motives behind everything that happens here. And usually when I struggle to understand something, I try to make people laugh. That's like my toxic trait, which feels like a strange move here. You know, that is not the vibe to be like, what's the deal with crucifixion? (laughs) Or if not that, I draw from my own experience and I lean into vulnerability, maybe use examples from my own life, but that doesn't really land either. Like personally with my crucifixion, that's not the move. Not me trying to find jokes in the literal darkest and saddest verses in all of scripture. So I've done the uncomfortable thing for me here, which is to lean into the uncertainty and try not to create answers, but to lean into the question. But what exactly is the question at hand? What question stirs within me when I interact with these ever familiar verses? The interesting thing is that for something so big happening in that passage, there's actually very little information. It's giving everything and it's giving nothing. We're left with so many questions. Like, was wine vinegar the Gatorade of its time? Was the darkness for theatrical effect? Where are the men? Why is everyone named Mary? That's just a few, just scratching the surface. Well, in our portion of scripture we're referencing today, the big question I keep coming back to is why did it have to go down this way? How did we get here? Why does the cross matter? What part of the story is Jesus fulfilling by staying on the cross? Why is this the way? Well, I've noticed a few things in relation to the Easter story that draw upon human nature. We do very human things to come to terms and understand when bad things happen. There are things we tend to do as people in this world, in modern times, that I'd like to explore in an effort to explain why things may have had to go down this way. One, our human nature causes us to fill in the blanks when we don't have answers. Two, we need a scapegoat. And three, our human nature causes us to draw closer to tragedy when it occurs. So that's the question we'll be exploring today during our time. Why did it have to go down this way? Well, to put it bluntly, humanity is still asking that question because it's open for debate. The answer has not yet been settled. But like many of the important events and cornerstone oral histories of our faith, there are several schools of thought. It's commonly referred to as atonement theory. And there are a lot of theories in this landscape. And I'm gonna cover a few popular ones here, but to be clear, this list is not exhaustive because 30 minutes feels like long enough for you to hear me talk about anything, but especially anything that ends in the word theory. (laughs) This might be new for you. 
In which case, my encouragement would be just to be curious, to have an open mind today. Or maybe you're an atonement theory expert, in which case, like earmuffs while I try to boil this down without embarrassing myself. Okay, so there's the moral influence theory, meaning Jesus died to be a positive moral influence and inspiration on humanity. There's the ransom theory, that Jesus died as a ransom sacrifice for payment to satisfy the debt on the souls of the human race, which we inherited from Adam's original sin. Like that one goes all the way back to the beginning. There's the Christus Victor theory, which states that Jesus dies in order to defeat the powers of evil. That's superhero stuff. There's the satisfaction theory, that Jesus' death is understood as a death to satisfy the justice of God, that sin is an injustice that must be balanced. There's the penal substitutionary atonement theory that Jesus is punished by death in place of us, sinners, in order to satisfy the justice of God. And there's the scapegoat theory. Here, Jesus dies as a scapegoat of humanity. James Allison summarizes the scapegoating theory like this. Christianity is a priestly religion which understands that it is God's overcoming of our violence by substituting himself for the victim of our typical sacrifices that opens up our being able to enjoy the fullness of creation as if death were not. Okay, that's super clear, right? Like, no biggie. That's a lot of discourse over one death. I can hardly think of other deaths in history that feel so loaded, so dense with implication and theories and schools of thought. There are centuries of scholarship on all of these different theories about Jesus and his role on the cross that day. Humanity is still asking these questions and theorizing. And I believe that's a human nature response to an intense event. Because the truth is most of this is inference or assumptions made on context clues. We're looking for Easter eggs, pun intended. We're trying to tie Jesus' death back so that we can make sense of a murder in no uncertain terms that feels to us in our times like maybe that was avoidable, maybe that was unnecessary. It makes me think of my obsession with true crime. I love true crime. That sounds bad, but I hope you, uh, hope you know what I mean. I take in a lot of media that is crime adjacent. So shows, documentaries, podcasts, books, all of it. To know me is to know that I always have a new recommendation of something in this vein. Come find me after if that's you too, because it's a lifestyle, you guys. And I am not the only one. According to Variety, true crime is the most popular podcast genre, and the average true crime fan takes in 3.8 hours of that genre a week. It's that enthralling. And what can be so interesting about dissecting the crimes of our day and also of the past, and what's so captivating about the true crime genre of media is that there are no cut and dry answers. If there were, the hope is that we would have like imminent arrests and justice, I don't know. We like the gray area because we get to participate in the question asking. So with well-known cases, like Jean Benet Ramsey, Charles Manson, O.J. Simpson, we could all list off a few. What makes these cases and stories so compelling is the lack of answers, information, motivation, and how we can use our own theories to fill in the blanks to gain some understanding, or so we think. So think of the Easter story as like the OG true crime story, because it does, it fits the bill. There's so much that humanity is still dissecting, and there is definitely gray area. And when the brain doesn't know the answer to something, it fills in the blanks. There's an article from Nest Labs that states this, our brain is wired to reduce uncertainty. The unknown is synonymous with threats that pose risks to our survival. The more we know, the more we can make accurate predictions and shape our future. The path forward feels more dangerous when we can sense essential gaps in our knowledge. With Jesus' death in particular, we add in the layer of fulfilling a prophecy so many years before, and it's no wonder that there is so much scholarship and so much study around what it all means and why. We have a serious gap in our knowledge with Jesus' death. 
We have verses, a few of them, within the Gospels, and it was a long time ago, and so we're desperate to fill in some of that uncertainty. So perhaps one reason that Jesus' crucifixion and death are so compelling to us is because it allows us to participate. Nothing's black and white. It draws us closer because it's a mystery of sorts. We want to dig in to gain more understanding. But maybe the whole point is to be compelled by that mystery and by the unanswered questions of why did things have to happen this way? Consider the idea that getting it right, landing on the right theory is not the end goal. It's secondary to participating in the asking itself. As we've discussed, many of the questions we have about Jesus' death may go unanswered. But even with that said, I do feel confident that we don't have to subscribe to the age-old adage, your sins put Jesus on the cross. That was the prevailing idea when I was growing up. Jesus died for your sins. That's like Sunday School 101. That's like one of the very first things they tell you when you show up at church growing up. I'm pretty sure it was like painted on a mural in the nursery walls of the church I grew up in. That is a lot to place on a child, by the way. Kids are very literal, so when we say something like, your sins put Jesus on the cross, they hear, you killed a guy. No joke. There's one theory, though, I'd like us to focus on for the sake of our exploration today, because it may be a fresh one for us to consider, and that's the scapegoat theory, which is based on the sacrificial system, or the actual scapegoat which is a term based on the ritual sacrifice described in Leviticus 16, which involves intentionally transferring the sins of the people onto a he-goat and driving the goat into the wilderness. But human beings were the victims in some settings, and this was probably the earlier practice. It is well documented, for example, that the ancient Greeks practiced a ritual requiring that one or more persons be selected set aside for a period, beaten, and then murdered. That sounds familiar, right? Here's what Rene Girard suggests about applying the scapegoat idea to the cross. In his book, I Saw Satan Fall Like Lightning, he says this, when human groups divide and become fragmented during a period of malaise and conflicts, they may come to a point where they are reconciled again at the expense of a victim. Observers nowadays realize without difficulty, unless they belong to the persecuting group, that this victim is not really responsible for what he or she is accused of doing. The accusing group, however, views the victim as guilty by virtue of a contagion similar to what we find in scapegoat rituals. The members of this group accuse their scapegoat with great fervor and sincerity. Perhaps our sin didn't put Jesus on the cross after all. Stay with me. The prevailing idea here is that humans by nature are hungry for violence, and it will culminate in a victim that will satisfy that desire. The cross and Jesus' crucifixion were a natural extension of the existing sacrificial and scapegoat system. And so... Jesus put Jesus himself on the cross because perhaps he was trying to be the one to suffer that fate instead of his followers, if you look at that theory in particular. And I don't mean followers us. I mean followers them, the disciples, the people that were present and also at risk of being accused, caught, tried, and murdered. There's a scapegoat, a sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God, Maybe that explains why Jesus' disciples fled after he surrendered and why there were only women there. Because they were trying to avoid the same fate and Jesus' surrender allowed them to do just that. Think of like one high schooler taking the fall when the cops break up a party. The rest flee to avoid the same outcome. One person takes the fall and kind of occupies the attention to allow space for the others to get away. So that is why the men are not there. Mystery solved, cold case no more. If you do consider this theory, the scapegoat theory, one thing that checks out for me here is that the death was public and embarrassing and humiliating. Which, if the goal of Jesus' death is to satisfy a human desire for a scapegoat, that would make sense. The gruesome nature of his death met the intensity of those who were persecuting and chasing him down to his ultimate demise. 
Have you ever wondered why it needed to be a public death? Why is it so tragic and violent and brutal? Can you imagine the Easter story still checking all of those boxes if Jesus just died peacefully in his sleep? I can't help but wonder if part of the reason Jesus' death had to go down this way is because it needed to be public. It had to be. It's a critical aspect to Jesus' resurrection and why Easter is still a story we tell all of these centuries later. That's what made it humiliating, and that's what allowed people to see it and ultimately to tell the tale. If Christ was crucified in private, yes, he maintains some of his dignity, but also no one sees it, and the truth about what happens becomes a topic for discussion. A few weeks back, we watched the Super Bowl, as many people did. My husband is a huge Chiefs fan, uh, not because of Taylor Swift, but because he's from Kansas City. And so it was a fun game for us to watch. If you're not a sports girly, I'm not either. I just like food. I like the snacks, people being excited. I like everybody's wearing matching shirts. That's the fun part for me. The Chiefs won in overtime, so it was very climactic and a thrilling ending to a long game. And at the end of the night, at the point we had left the party that we'd been attending to take our kids home and put them to bed. And so I come back downstairs after the game has ended, and I'm surprised that they kept showing footage of the players from the losing team, the 49ers, just sitting on the bench. It looks like this. They're just sitting with like absolute sorrow on their faces. The, the confetti is swirling around them. The opponents are celebrating on the field. And I asked my husband, why do they do that? Why don't they run back to the locker room and cry in private? That's what I would do. I wouldn't want people to see me like that after a loss. And he explained to me that the players want to remember that. They want to feel and understand that very real pain because they will use it to motivate themselves in the future. They don't want to hide from their lowest low. They want to feel it, remember it. They want to never go there again. And there's something here that I think we could apply to Jesus as well. There's something here about being a witness to a loss that we can't turn away from. And what makes it compelling and draws us nearer to the person of Jesus is just that. One thing I can't get off my mind as I imagine myself in the story of Easter is the idea of adjacency. Everyone wants to state their proximity to hard things because it gives us a way to cope. It helps us explain to ourselves just why we're so affected. It's hard to deal with tragic and unimaginable circumstances, and so we want to process that. And the best way to do that is to share why we feel something so deeply and how close we are to it. Not only do our minds fill in the blanks when we don't have full comprehension, of the reasons behind bad things, but we kind of like to be close to them too. Even more distinctly when tragedies happen in the monoculture, so think things like Columbine, 9-11, JFK, etc. Even when certain celebrities pass away, we want to find closer ties to explain why we feel so much and why the events have such an impact on us. We all know the person who tells the story like it's their own. They're like, yeah, my brother's girlfriend's uncle's twin was in New York when 9-11 happened. I'm like, I mean, 8 million people live in New York. That's not entirely rare. Or to call my own self out, uh, I remember my dad was in Scotland uh, when 9-11 happened, and I used that as my, like, tragedy proximity claim. I was like, oh my gosh, my dad has, uh, he, he can't come back. He's been there for a whole week. He's stuck in Scotland. I don't know. I was 15 years old. I was not at all mature, and I was not lacking in dramatics, but I wanted to be closer to it, and that was my like, claim to fame in that moment, if you will. We tell these stories for decades. My parents' generation can still tell me where they were and exactly what they were doing when JFK was assassinated. It becomes a story that we are a part of and that is a part of us. Even if we aren't involved, the trauma can feel both collective and deeply individual. Or perhaps you've lost a loved one and someone claims that they were best friends and you have not seen that person around for years. Perhaps it seems like a stretch when someone posts a photo of themselves and a late celebrity. 
makes you roll your eyes. We read endless accounts of tragedies and are glued to the news to hear if there are breaking details. We look at timelines and infographics and photos and security footage. We're trying to figure out why we care so much. If you grew up in a Jewish household or you have Jewish family or friends or perhaps you yourself are a Yiddish bubby, you may have heard about the kvetching order. Or for the rest of us who don't know Yiddish, we can just call it ring theory. Wikipedia describes it this way. Ring theory is a concept or paradigm in psychology that recommends a strategy for dealing with the stress a person may feel when someone they encounter, know, or love is undergoing crisis. The concept, developed by clinical psychologist Susan Silk, advises those surrounding a person in crisis to direct expressions of their own feelings of stress towards those less close to that person and direct only support toward those closer to the person, using a diagram of concentric circles to illustrate the concept. Here's a diagram to show exactly how it looks. If you want to boil all of this down, the idea is this that in times of crisis, comfort inwards and dump outwards. This is a guide to help us from sticking our foot in our mouth when we engage with tragedy. It's a roadmap to keep us on track to comfort those who mourn and not make ourselves the mourners when that is not our role. It keeps us from navel-gazing, from self-importance, and from becoming the central figure in a story that is not ours to own. Did you notice one thing about the scripture we read today, that the women played such a central role? There's something interesting about the women being the witnesses to Christ's final moments, and also <laughs> his resurrection too. This is one of the first instances in the Bible where women are explicitly referred to as disciples of Christ. Women will carry this story and contribute it to the oral history of Easter. Women will continue to make this story known. Me standing here telling you about Easter and Jesus and his crucifixion echoes and harkens back to the ancestors and mothers of our faith doing just that. And that's not lost on me. It's worth noting that if the men were present here for these moments, along with the women, we would have prioritized their voices. We would have primarily listened to the men who saw and heard what happened because women's stories meant next to nothing at that time. Is it possible that this was by design? That the disciples fled out of fear for their lives because, remember, someone needed to be crucified to satisfy the human desire for a scapegoat, and they didn't want it to be them. And that means the women remained. And so we're forced, in a way, to believe these women, these first female disciples of Christ. Girl gang, rise up. And like I mentioned prior, why is everyone named Mary? It's so confusing. It's like the Jennifer for the Gen Xers, or the Ashley for my generation, the millennials, or the Madison for the Gen Zers. It's like on The Bachelor when everyone's name is Lauren, so we have to start using last initials to separate them. I kind of imagine that this is what Mark is doing here. He's labeling them so that we can keep track. He's like, this is Mary M, and then we're gonna call her Mary J. These women themselves are following the kvetching order, or ring theory. They are loyal and caring to Jesus until his last moments, and then they themselves move toward the center of the ring as they now mourn the loss of their friend, their teacher, their guide, their son. It can be tempting in crisis, stress, and turmoil to try to seek comfort from those closer to the situation than us. But I wonder if the invitation from Jesus is to subvert this order on its head entirely. To move closer and to seek comfort from the very person of Jesus at the center. To take the parts of us that need understanding and want to fill in the gaps regarding Jesus' death and want to be close to tragedy, all those human parts of us, and to bring them inwards and not outwards. 
Ultimately, my hope is that we could ruminate and explore the idea that it's our human nature that created and sustains the Easter story. That's why it's so compelling even now, thousands of years later. Easter isn't just a story of God, it's a story of us as well. Maybe after all, we need less theories about why things had to happen the way that they did and instead need to become comfortable with the nature of the story as it stands. Unknowable, mysterious, and dangerous. Maybe getting it right is not the point, but asking the question, why did it have to go down this way, is more of the point. Well, maybe it had to go down this way to pull us nearer. Our human nature makes us obsessively curious with unanswered questions, okay, check. Our human nature makes us desire a scapegoat, check. And our human nature drives us to make claims of proximity to tragedy, check. And because God knows us best of all, God knew these very things and perhaps knew that Jesus' death would pull on these heartstrings within us all. And if Jesus' purpose is and was to make the unseeable God known, Easter does just that. This Easter, let us consider that God's design for Jesus' death and ultimate resurrection is an invitation for us to draw nearer to the knowable person of Jesus and to see ourselves in the story. If the divine wanted us interacting with the story of Jesus' death all these thousands of years later, they knew exactly how to do it. By inviting us to do what we do best, to be humans interacting with the story of mystery and violence and horror and tragedy and ultimately death. When we get closer, we see Jesus for who he was and who he is. God incarnate, God's son. And perhaps that is why things had to go down this way, to entice us to move closer and to know Jesus more. Let's pray together. God, as we enter into Holy Week and start to consider the death of Jesus, will you encourage us to draw nearer to the story? Will you invite us into the holy mystery of the cross, engage us in this sacred, ancient story, and show us that your design was to bring us close to Jesus, even then, but also still? We know Easter is on the horizon, and so prepare our hearts for resurrection and all that's made new. We love you and we thank you for your love for us and how we can find your heart for us in these stories even today. Amen. As we move into our time of Eucharist, we want to remind you that here at DCC, we practice something that's commonly referred to as open table communion. And what this means is that everyone is invited to participate in this practice. We acknowledge that this is not our table. This is not the table of DCC, this is God's table, and everyone is welcome without exception. When we participate in communion, we remember these words from the Gospel of Matthew from the night that Jesus was betrayed. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As you come, please make your way up the middle and the side aisles. We'll have volunteers serving communion at the end of the stage and down in front. Take a piece of bread, dip it in the wine or the grape juice, and return to your seat down the diagonal aisles. As a reminder, the bread is gluten-free, And in the tall glass, we have wine, and in the short glass, we have grape juice. I invite you to join us in remembering the invitation of Jesus to participate in this sacred practice. Come as you're ready.